Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 26, 2020. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. Still working through a lot of issues. And then on top of all that, GoToWebinar seems to be having some issues, at least this morning, making it more difficult. So we have a new, if you're watching a recording of this on YouTube, we do have a new link to sign up. So you will have to sign up again. And I'll work to get some emails out to people who have previously signed up. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep them focused on what I'm talking about on the slides, just so my ADD doesn't catch, doesn't kick in. There's a lot of thoughts in my head, a lot of things I want to say that I haven't put into the slides just yet, so I might forget. But if you don't mind, keep them on the slides. When we get to the live charts, ask about anything you want. And also, when we get to the live charts, you can ask about as many stocks as you want. Just ask about them one thing, one time, one stock at a time. So what do we talk about? What are we going to focus on? Well, when bad things happen, news, hurricane, trade, that should be trading, systems, and a lot of random thoughts. So basically, we're going to talk about this big old elephant in the room for 2020 bear market before we do all that there's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as often sum it up stealing a line from greg morris all predictions about the future a lot of stuff can happen between now and then before we get started i got an email from someone that said trading is so easy and i'm like really and i said how old are you it's like 23 it's like send me a picture so he sent me a picture that's john p he's a trader and he thinks it's easy for some reason, young guy. All right, before we get into the meat of things, I wanna show you some things that are relative to this market, but will apply to future markets and other markets, just in case I get hit with a beer truck, or by a beer truck, I should say, or my wife kills me while I'm in quarantine. <laughs> As I said in the Stock Charts show yesterday, Stock Charts TV show, I'm a little bit better for this quarantining than most because I'm used to being here anyway. Everybody else is getting a little stir crazy. When I go in the house, it's like I got a honeydew waiting for me every time I go in there. I think there's a 100% chance of honeydews for all you married guys out there. Now, obviously, this is a fluid situation, so I think everybody here is aware of this, but I do, or I have, I should say, putting been putting some bear market updates in and material relative to a bear market, specifically this one, obviously on my website and that's on this top menu and that's what that looks like bear market 2020 updates now i was watching the stock charts tv special market edition yesterday and earlier today again and it's really good if you get a chance to watch it watch it if you go to my youtube channel which i think is youtube.com slash c slash dave landry you can find, I liked it this morning, so it should be in my list of like things. And Arthur Hill was talking about that bad things happen below the 200 day moving average. And that's Charlie Vallejo and Mike Gayard. That's their research. And that got me thinking that bad things happen below the 10% line now the 10 percent line is what i've been using in this tfm 10 percent system and that's the 50-week closing high okay not the high high but the closing high less 10 percent and the way i have it programmed in is 90 percent of that 50-week closing high so it's the same however you want to look at it so subtract 10 percent from the 50-week closing high or just take 90 percent of that 50-week closing high and that's going to give you the 10% line. Now, if we take a look at the 10% line going back about 40 years or so, maybe even longer, you could see that as a general statement, you want to be long above the 10% line and out or even short below the 10% line. So the research I was doing this morning was that bad things do happen below the 10% line, just like it does happen below the 200 day moving average. You could see there were a few times in here where you could call out a whipsaw, not that we're trading this as a system in and of itself, but a few times it does dip below that 10% line and does recover 
fairly quickly. Now, in 2019, I've beaten a dead horse on this, even though we did recover quickly from this, and you could argue that it was a whipsaw, that was a pretty nasty spill in the market. And I think if you held through that, you probably have held through this one so far, and now you're learning the tough lesson of that'll work until it don't. Now, if this market goes straight back up, you've learned nothing. I'm not preaching to you people. I'm talking about the buying hope people. And you can see that something bad has already happened since we crossed this line on, I think it was February 27th. And we'll, I'll confirm that when we get to the system results here in just one second, which is based on the 10% line plus a few other parameters. And I'll flesh that out in one second. As I've been saying at nauseam, back in that December slide, I was picking up a U-Haul and the guy I had on CNBC and I didn't say that, oh, I'm Big Dave and I got a website and I'm the Grand Pumbaa or anything like that. I just said, hey, I dabble in the markets. He says, yeah, man, I'm glad I held on through that December slide. I just wish I would have bought more. And I'm thinking to myself, you poor bastard, that'll work until the don't. But I guess experience is the best teacher and that poor bastard is probably having a bad experience now. And I'm not making fun of him, it's just, it happens. And I beat the dead horse in that quite often. Market is a bad teacher. So what I thought it'd be interesting to do, you've seen this histogram before, but flipped over to show when the market goes more than 10% away from that 50-week closing high. Now, this goes all the way back to the Great Depression. And so my point is, once a market loses 10%, you better be really careful because something bad could happen. And there's a 20% line, just to give you an idea. Media defines a bear market as anything below 20%. And then here's your 50% line, which we've gone over a couple of times, especially if you're looking at peak to trough moves. But you can see that once it gets below 10%, it becomes dangerous because it could go down 20%, 30%, 40%, or more. So those that's what the slides look like. The point is that it can get ugly once you get past 10% or whatever other me metric you want to use. Like the two gentlemen mentioned earlier, they did some research with the 200-day moving average amongst some other things. And they pointed out that things can get ugly once they begin to get ugly. So you can see anything below that 10%, you've got to be really careful in the markets because it can get ugly really fast. So the Great Depression was way back here, and you can see that the market really lost a lot of its value. But even in 2009 and in 2000, we lost a lot of value in the market. And I'll show you some of those drawdowns in just one second. So here's the 2020 slide, a little hard to see. So I enlarged it for you. You can see we've, we've pushed over 30% to the downside of the closing basis since those new highs back in February. Now, lots of news flowing into the market. I don't trade these news reversals, but I do factor them into the equation as part of the puzzle to help me wrap my head around what's going on. Now, a while back, I think it was in 2011, I was speaking, and I forget where, but somebody raised their hand, it might have been Dallas but or Houston, and somebody raised their hand and said, hey Dave, um, Steve Jobs not doing so well, as you know, it's probably inevitable that he's gonna pass. How do you feel about Apple with Steve Jobs passing? Well, as a technician, I really don't care, but one way of looking at it would be to do to look at the news and news reversal. And I probably first learned this type of reasoning from Larry Connors. I was flipping through Street Smarts yesterday and I noticed that he was talking about the news reversals there. And I think I might've saw it in one of his professional trading journals many years ago. Anyway, with a news reversal, you wait for, or an event occurs, I should say, and then you figure out where you wanna get in after that event and it's a kind of a fade the news type of strategy so when they asked me hey dave what's going to happen when steve jobs passes and i said well whatever day he passes go ahead and mark that 
And when we take out that closing high, we will look to get long above that. So he passed on the following, on the prior day and after the close. And then so you take the close of the day that the news is in the market and this becomes your buy line, so to speak. You see the Apple did sell off a little bit, but when it gets above that bad news day, it becomes a buy. Now it's had some big retraces since, but as you can see, it had a pretty decent run, especially given Apple's volatility back then. It wasn't that high back then. Right now, everything's got an extremely high volatility. It's crazy. So I would keep this news event type of thing in mind and put a buy line in when the news shows up or a sell line if it's positive news. So let's take a look at the S&P 500. So we had the bailout passed last night. So if we take out the close from yesterday, right around about, let's just say 2475, just kind of eyeball it, then the market would be a short below that level. Now, also, if you are a trend follower and you trade pullbacks, it's also would be a, let me get a pin working, it would also be a short based on this pullback. So, and we're gonna talk a lot about this in one second, but so obviously we had a big thrust lower and now we have a pullback. Well, lo and behold, we also have a news event, which gives us a sell line. So the point I think I'm trying to get you is I wouldn't rush out and trade these big picture news reversals, but if they set up within your normal technical analysis, then it's something that you might want to consider because it just sort of reaffirms your, your thinking, okay? By the way, one of the random thoughts that I just had right as I'm going live, somebody in the YouTube comments underneath the video that me and Arthur Hill and a bunch of other people uh, put out for stockcharts.com contributed to, I should say, said that technical analysis mumbo jumbo coronavirus is what's doing this market and we should average in. It's like, oh geez, this poor bastard. <laughs> but if you look at this chart, you can see that we had a thrust, a little pullback, a big thrust, another pullback, you know, thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback, rinse and repeat so far. As you'll see in one second, I don't know how many of the signals I have in these slides because some of these slides were left over. But we had hourly signals, we had daily signals, and believe it or not, we're actually getting an hourly buy signal now as I'm going live here. And I uh, hope YouTube doesn't demonetize me if I drop an F-bomb when now my little quote screen knocks me out. Hopefully it won't though. So one thing you need to do, don't predict, okay? Don't ever try to predict markets. Follow markets. As I often say, we are trend followers and in order to follow a trend, you must first have a trend to follow. Well, right now we have a downtrend, but obviously there's going to be some retraces along the way. It's pretty good to play out these scenarios in your head, just so when you see things unfold, you're not surprised. And also it helps to give you, it helps you to wrap your head around what the market should be doing. But you also have to keep an open mind that the market could do whatever it wants. So I'm a big believer in thrust, pullback, thrust, pullback. So let's just call a, the low, B, the pullback, and then C, the new leg down. Now, real quick, I don't want that to, I don't want to give you an impression that's like an Elliott wave or something like that, because it's not. Elliott wave works when a market is trending and the analysis agrees with the trend. And a lot of Elliotticians will show you a chart where it just worked out perfectly. What they don't show you, and I've seen a lot of people get hurt over the years, and a lot of people who are a lot smarter than me, I, I'm not saying it, it's kind of like Trump. He retweets something, he gets in a lot of trouble. Well, he should have retweeted it, right? So I guess I'm, I'm kind of retweeting something, so to speak, here. But people who are a lot smarter than me have pointed out that they've never met a rich Elliotician, 
okay? Maybe one that's traded it for a while when the trend equals the charts may, might do okay. Now, I have seen some technicians actually put a trend filter in and they don't take the signals or whatever or do a wave count against their trend filter. But you could argue like, well, is that really Elliott wave? I mean, I don't know. It seems like the, the trend counts always come out, the wave counts always come out long after the fact. Anyway, I don't want to digress too far into that, but I, I some very famous people, I want to say it's like Soros and a bunch of other people threw millions of dollars at Elliott Wave trying to figure it out, figure out whether it had an edge or not, and they couldn't. So anyway, but if you're um, if you're doing well with Elliott Wave, God bless you. My very small representative sample, which I'm using air quotes, cannot really be a net representative sample, was I did have one client print in money with Elliott Wave in the downturn of 2009. Unfortunately, when the tide turned, he was still fighting the trend. So he made a, a, a boatload of money. I encouraged him to cash out and pay off his house and some other things. And he just kept on plowing money into the short side of the market and he fought the trend. I don't know how far, but usually when, when a client disappears after they printed money, it's not a good thing. So I fear the worst for him. So anyway, getting back to scenarios with the market, this is not Elliott Wave or anything like that. It's just the old thrust pullback, thrust pullback, cocktail napkin approach that I take to trading in general. So obviously we had to thrust down and we're in a bit of a retrace rally now. So I have a question mark. I think it's possible that maybe A has been completed. We know that the we know we have a pivot low on March 23rd, okay? or at least an inflection point. We don't know where B is gonna go, how far the market will take us. And then C would be the next leg lower, which is sort of a likely scenario. So I'm thinking this market will retrace up. You know, I hope it's I hope it's bottomed out, okay? And, you know, it's gonna suck. I'll get stopped out of my shorts, but that's okay. I've been around for a long time. I'm a big boy, I could handle it. I've scaled out, fortunately, along the way. And I'll start getting long. That's perfectly fine with me. It's a lot easier to trade a bear, a bull market, than it is to trade a bear market. I'm gonna touch upon those things in just a few seconds. So we're somewhere between A and B. I would I would have to guess, and then we're on our way back down to C. Yes, it is very. It's much harder to trade a bear market, Zach. And I see you doing a lot of things. <laughs> You're kind of my exhibit A. I want not to do a lot of, on these a lot of things. I don't want to pick on you too much. But if this is your first bear market, learn. Zach, you know, be careful with these invert sh inverted shares and all that other crazy stuff, leverage stuff, holding overnight on those things. If you're shorting, the retrace rallies suck, okay? It feels great when things are going in your favor and you're printing money on the short side. But just know that that's often short lived and it's uh, no pun intended, I guess. Now, one thing I've been saying lately, if you're new to trading and you got decimated by holding on, and this goes not to you traders that are attending live today and the people in my Facebook group, but more so the people who are who have bought into the buy and hold Kool-Aid, what I would recommend you do, and if you go in and watch presentations that I did in 2000, and 2007, late 2007 that is, early 2000, I talked a lot about signals and the market rolling over and things like that. And then in more last couple of years, we talked about this 10% line, the importance of that along with the TFM 10% system. To learn all these simple systems for next time as I preach, and I don't know who said it originally, but every asset class at some point in your lifetime will lose half of its value. And I'm gonna beat the dead horse on that a little bit. Oh, there it is right there. So this is why I'm not a big fan of buy and hold. I've seen, this is my third bear market since I've been trading. And it probably, well, hopefully I'll live long enough, but it probably won't be my last. And so losing half your money is not uncommon in any investment, uh, real estate, gold, cocoa, oil, just name something. 
and it's lost half its value probably several times. Buy low and sell high has ruined so many lives. You're much better off buying high and selling higher. Now, Arthur Hill yesterday said trading a bear market can be brutal. It's like going sailing in a hurricane. So you're going to have to be a really good skipper and have a really strong boat. And I, I tend to agree with him. Now, we are trader types here. That's what we do. That's what we pay to do. If you can't be in the trend you love, love the trend you're in. But I would caution two people, two forms of people. Those who this is their first bear market, like my little buddy Zach here, who's talking to me in chat, you're not going to get decimated. You, you just, just keep your head about you, and it's okay to sit in cash. The other people I am referring to are those that think that the market is a value, and they're going to go in and try to buy like some guy on youtube said technical analysis mumbo jumbo just average down on the slide like it's a gift no it's not Danny. now as i've been saying is the market of value well i often say it's often darkest right before it gets more dark and that's an ancient trend following moron proverb and this is something i talked about yesterday in my stock chart show NASDAQ lost 50% back in 2000. It seemed pretty cheap back then. As I've said recently, I saw someone in, well, I don't want to say where, but they said that when a market is down 50%, you should sell puts. And I'm thinking, well, that'll work until they don't. And if you don't believe me, just go back and look at history. If you'd have sold, par sold puts when the NASDAQ was down 50%, you would probably be a hurt and pop because it lost half of its value again. You would think, okay, market's lost 50% of its value. It's, a, it, it's cheap, right? Nope, it went on to lose half its value again. That was right, that was in the 2000 bear market, which tech stocks, as you know, got hit especially hard. So what about fundamentals? Oh, geez. The fundamental factor suggests what ought to happen in the market while the technical factor suggests what actually is happening in the markets. And that's Schaubacher Baca from Stock Market Profits, a little bit newer thought on that. Comes from my brother from another mother, Greg Morris, my good friend. All of the financial theories and all of the fundamentals will never be any better than what the trend of the market will allow. So I just, follow the trend and that's why they call me the trend following moron and i was looking at some people using some very complex indicators and a bunch of g with stuff and i'm like you know that's pretty cool but the bottom line is is you is or is you isn't in a trend and i forget who said that i, I got it out of tom mcclellan's forum or the aepta forum i forget where but he was quoting someone that's that was his answer when somebody says, how do you know if it's in a trend? And he says, he just looks at the charts and asks himself, is you is or is you isn't in a trend? Now, I just want to go through this real quick because I did put this out there in the uh, aforementioned show. A family member called me in a panic about a year ago they didn't call me ahead of time unfortunately but they called their broker and said hey could you put me in something more conservative than what i'm in and they said sure so they put her in amongst other things and by the way all asset classes will lose 50 percent of the value at some point in your lifetime right well a lot of the stuff they put her in lost over half its value already a lot of the quote unquote conservative stuff. So amongst other things, they put her into five fundamental funds. That's one, two, three, four, five. So you can see what has happened. And some of these, and it sickens me when I actually do the math on them, and I'm kind of getting pissed off as I look at it right now. So here's something that was at 40 something, and now it's at 20 something. So this fundamental stock, which fundamental ETF, which probably makes a lot of sense. These are good companies, right? Okay. Well, 
that'll work until it don't, obviously. And you can see even good companies get hit really hard. Now I'm seeing a lot of people come out the woodworks and try to apply logic to the market. Logic does not really apply that much in the markets. And I'm seeing a lot of these theme investing. And theme investing makes a lot of sense. So what would theme investment be right now? Well, maybe invest in some of these online communication companies because everybody seems to be working from home until further notice, and that makes a lot of sense. Now, if you find a stock that's a communication stock and you think it's related to this theme, that's fine, but only buy it if it is set up. I saw somebody recently want to buy a stock that was headed straight down, but they thought they had a really good theme as to why they should buy it. Just remember that markets trade on emotions, not logic. And the way I wrap my head around that is every time I make a buy or sell, I think about how emotional I am in that process. And it's impossible, by the way, to eliminate your emotions. I'm sure a lot of people right now are having to sell because they need the money for retirement, okay? There's a ton of reasons why people buy and sell. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and other people use more sophisticated methods. And that's the late mother of Tom McClellan, Marion McClellan, who once said that, and if you've attended more than one of these presentations, you've probably heard me say that. So just remember, markets trade purely on emotions, and there's really not a whole lot of logic involved. And by the way, what you're thinking, everybody's probably already thought of that, okay? Now, I know Clorox did have a pop higher, but it's already come all the way back in, 100% retrace. That would be another one of those things, okay? So again, buy, and, buy low and sell high has ruined many of lives. Remember, as a trend follower, you're gonna be a little late to the game. Okay, a little late to the party, and you're going to overstay your welcome. So this gentleman in Yahoo, YouTube, I should say, said that technical analysis doesn't work. I was like, well, really? Okay, well, I got stopped out of a lot of stocks that are a hell of a lot lower now than they were, okay? And I shorted some stocks, and they went lower, okay? And I took some partial profits. Now, maybe I'll get creamed in a retrace rally. But hopefully, I know you said hope, but hopefully I'll get stopped out for a profit overall. So I think technical analysis works. I think technical analysis works especially well when you have these world events that are coming in and the market does what it should do based on the world events. As in, it probably works even better when you have a world event come in and the market just shrugs it off. In other words, it goes the opposite way of the news. So obviously, what's going to take for the for the market to bottom? Well, it's going to have to start going down first, and maybe it has stopped going down. We'll know it when we see it, okay? Like Justice Potter Stewart. So I realize that's a Captain Obvious statement, but the dumber approach you take to the markets, dumb meaning price based, prove it to me by going up, and stop going down. Prove it to me by stop going down and start going up. I think the better off you will be longer term in this game. Now, as I often preach, signals are fractal. What occurs in one time frame occurs in others. So what I would suggest you do is use an hourly chart to get a heads up, but just realize that you could get a lot of whipsaw in there. Jim and the group does a lot of research here, and I've been enjoying his research by the group, I mean the Facebook group, and I know he does a lot of timing off the hourly chart. And he was probably the first person out of this market when we had an hourly sell signal. And I've kind of beat the dead horse in this chart, so I don't want to go over too much, but you can see the bow ties came together, the S&P 500 pulled back a little bit. And on the afternoon of February 21st, we had a trigger to the downside after all time highs. By the way, with the hourly chart, if you are going to time off the hourly, it's good to have all-time highs or major, major, major highs or all-time lows, if it's an individual issue, 
or major, major, major lows. We don't want stocks to go to all-time lows, obviously. So there was the sell signal on the 21st. Now, I've been talking about watching for an hourly chart sells a buy signal. And lo and behold, we got one a little while ago. And I was thinking last couple of days, well, there's no way we're going to get a buy signal anytime soon. Okay. And then this morning, I'm like, well, let me just check the S&P 500. And I think yesterday we looked at the diamonds or something or the Dow Jones. And I was shocked to see that it actually had bow tied up on an hourly basis. Now, I'm not saying rush out and buy stocks right now, but I am saying that we have a bit of an hourly, or we do have an hourly signal to the upside, which triggered a little while ago in the overall market. Now, keep in mind, you're still fighting that downtrend, okay? So don't rush out and buy stocks yet, but this sort of confirms that we are in that retrace rally, that little B leg up as I labeled it. Now, I've been kind of beating Landry Light to death lately, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but Landry Light is lows are greater than the moving average. Uh, for longer term market timing, I like the 50 week moving average, but play around with this with a variety of moving averages. I sort of came up with something similar a while back to Linda Rasky's Holy Grail, where she uses a trend indicator. I think she uses ADX and a moving average where I just use daylight, meaning that, or Landry light, for to tell me what the trend of the market is, and then I look for a pullback down. Maybe I should hedge my inverted shares with non-inverted shares. No, don't hedge. Hedging is a bad idea. We'll get back to you. <laughs> so you could see the Landry light will keep you mostly long. This indicator on the bottom here, which I do have in Metastock. If you have Metastock, it's in there. It's in everybody's package in Metastock. You don't have to ask me for it or anything. And then in stock charts, this chart did come from stock charts, but they're not ready to re release it just yet. So they probably would tell me to stop teasing it. But you can see 2015, 16, we did have some downside Landry light. And if memory serves, those were pretty ugly markets. I remember it was really hard holding on the longs, got stopped out of them, did a little shorting, didn't do phenomenal, but it was a, a market where you really had to kind of grind it out. And after all was said and done, you probably would have been better just staying out of the market. And that would be one signal to tell you that things aren't fantastic. Obviously things improved between 2016, 2000 and 19. It got a little ugly in 2019, okay? But it did come right back. So a lot of the mess that we're in right now, or some of the mess we're in right now, can be attributed to the fact that the market was a bad teacher after that spill in 2019. And quoting my little friend, I'm glad I held on. I wish I'd have bought more. So unfortunately, he's probably trying to catch that falling knife right now. Maybe it'll work for him. I hope it does. But you can see we did have a nice trend, obviously, from that point forward. And then we turn red once again, meaning that the highs are less than the 50-week moving average. TFM 10% system says that, hey, if we go more than 10% away from the 50-week closing high and we close below the 50-week moving average, we need to get out of the market. And if we have two weeks of Landry Light above the 50-week moving average and we're within 10% of the 50-week closing high, then we should get back into the market. And then, of course, we need to sell when we close below the moving average, which it did up around 3,000. And we're also 10% away from the 50 week closing high. And if you look down here in a chart, this is a little 10% line. Again, I don't know when it says pullbacks, but it's actually percent away. I don't know when this will be available to everyone, but right now it is available to everyone in Metastock. So let's take a look at the TFM 10% system just real quick, because I've been updating this quite a bit. Again, the point born to term from Ian McActivy, the late great Ian McActivy. If you can find these presentations, 
they're really good for a laugh. You know, it's kind of hard to make people laugh in this financial world, but God, he had some good at presentations. But you can see that the diaper change is how much you lose or would have lost, I should say. How big of a loss you have avoided by not, by getting out of the way, okay? So, so far, the diaper change by getting out of the way would have been 28%. On that last sales signal in February. And as I've been saying, the more the market goes down, the better the 10% TFM system looks during these drawdowns, obviously, because it gets out of the way. It does not short. I have not tested it on the short side. I was just looking for something to give me an objective measure on when I might want to think about getting out of the market to avoid that big old diaper change moment. So again, the results look a hell of a lot better when the market drops and keeps on dropping because it gets out of the way. When I publish this, this it just the opposite happened and what normally happens. Seems like you publish a system and it stops working. But two years ago, the buy and hold, it was just barely beating buy and hold, if that. But now it's starting to look a little bit better at 1,000% returns versus roughly 800% returns. And we'll see we'll see how it all shakes out. One thing that's kind of cool is it's only 11 trades in 31 years. And I have been working on going all the way back to the turn of the century or a little bit later, whatever my data goes to. And it looks like it worked out pretty good there too because the diaper change back then was like 86% or 80% from the trigger. So it looks like it's something that's worked both going backwards, which all systems work going backwards, right? If not, you just tweak them a little bit. You know, like earlier, we said something, you know, nothing bad things happen below the 200 moving average. When I did consulting and programming for people, if they couldn't get a system to work, they would always say, throw a moving average at it. Just don't take longs if you're below the moving average, which I thought was kind of interesting. But it made a lot of these systems work. Something as simple as that. So I've been the dead horse in this before. Weekly bow ties, we had one win in 2000. We had one 2003. We had one right after 2007. And then we obviously had another one in 2009. The one in 2009, as I've been saying, or said ad nauseum, was a little late to the game, but it still got you in at relatively low levels and the market is what tripled since then. Now, one thing I've been really guilty lately of, and I'll admit it, I've been sucked into more trades that I should uh, I don't know if I'm trying to outsmart this market or what. It just seems that things that used to work, we were talking about this on Facebook yesterday. I look back at some of my trades and I look back at my notes and my trading journal and all these things going back months and months and months. And things like the opening gap reversals just worked. It was like, I'm not going to say taking candy from the baby, but it was like it would work and work and work and then I'd lose on one or two. Or I get too full of myself and leverage up a little bit, lose a little money, and then just go back to grinding it out. But for the most part, these open gap reversals, meaning a day trade, worked out really nicely. In more recent times, they have not worked as well. And I have found myself trying to catch retrace rallies and try to catch catch the sell off and all. And I think after all is said and done, it's probably an exercise of futility. So just be really, really careful. The trader in me will continue to play these open gap reversals, but I've been becoming more and more selective and I've also been using a little bit wider berth on the entries and the stops. If you don't, if you're watching recording of this, you wanna learn about open gap reversals, we kind of beat that dead horse in the Q&A section of the website. Now, even if you are an investor and not a trader type, as I said last week, you need to, at least in the future, have a plan for all asset classes. When I'm, this family member said, will you help me in the future with all this stuff once we get out of this mess? And I said, absolutely. And before we buy anything, we're gonna determine ahead of time where, we're going, where we are going to be wrong. Um, ironically, one of my wife's friends was asking me a little bit about trading and stuff. And, 
few months ago and and I've just been slow to respond to her and you know other than give her the website and all but I haven't followed up but I actually started an article based on that and I wish I would have finished it before this downturn you know shoulda coulda woulda but anyway one of the questions in there is like what ask your advisor what do you do when things get ugly and it seems like when I've been asking people that the advisor says, well, we don't want to lose our position. And most of them say, well, you don't want to get shaken out. Okay. Well, it's okay. You know, you don't want to get shaken out. If you're going to shake it out in 2019, like the guy I was talking about earlier, I guess I should pick on local people. They might hunt me down and find me. <laughs> I doubt he's watching today. He's busy crying. He's trying to catch bottoms or something. But anyway, before I digress too far, just have a plan in place. And, you know, don't want to get shaken out it's not a plan i would study some really simple trend following techniques start with just the price bar start with something like the 10 percent line which is the pure price indicator it's not really an indicator it's just a, a line on the chart that's 10 percent less than where the market was based on its highest close okay study something really simple like that and then if you must begin to mess around a little bit with moving averages and stuff and here's the thing i've studied everything in the world and i've plotted oscillators and all these other crazy things and you know it reached a point where you could no longer see the price bars and i thought that all that stuff would really make me money but if you strip away all that the bottom line is you have to catch a you have to catch a price move and the best thing to do to catch a price move is to study price and trade in the direction of the price. My methodology is very imperfect as is trend following in general, okay? But the only way you're ever gonna make money on a trade is to capture a trend, so why not be a trend follower all the time? You will be a little late to join the party, as I said earlier, and you will overstay your welcome. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. My own portfolio did much, much worse than the model portfolio because the model portfolio i'm not going to say it's conservative because i do put a lot of crazy stocks in there but i try to keep the first do no harm dr creed and i forget what the latin is on that primum non or non or something like that anyway and that, that really paid off during a downturn and me being a little bit more aggressive on the long side actually hurt quite a bit. But the shorts did help out a lot. You know, it's kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, I'm going to help this relative of mine by helping her sell down to the sleeping level. You know, the scary effing thing is, and I don't want to go off on a rant because my blood will boil, but her money is locked up and so she's working to get it unlocked right now but on this retrace rally you know i i really can't give direct financial advice but maybe think about selling down to the sleeping level and that just means that if you're tossing and turning at night you can't sleep because you're worried about your investments you might consider lightening up and if we get the big fat retrace rally it might be a good time to do so but hey you know what do what's right for you. I am not a registered investment advisor. Be careful with theme-based investments. Again, you know, stuff that makes a lot of sense might not necessarily work. And by the way, don't pick that bottom. <laughs> Relative called me recently, wanted to buy airlines, and they've dropped significantly since then. We were in a liquidation market, and we might be in a liquidation market again after the retrace rally. I don't know. But coming into this crap, and the reason that portfolio from that conservative, quote unquote, investments, or from those conservative investments got decimated was because the gold, the gold in the portfolio got creamed. The fundamentals stocks in that portfolio got creamed. The safe bid cap stocks in that portfolio got creamed. The bond portion, the big old hunk of fixed income, and I'm making air quotes in the air, and I'm making that little sign that Joe Biden made the other day, 
didn't mean to, but he made a little sign with his hand, <laughs> universal sign of, you know what? Anyway, those stocks got creamed, okay? And that was supposed to be fixed income. And they got creamed because bonds got creamed, gold got creamed, stocks got creamed, everything got creamed. <laughs> it's like Oprah. You get cream, you get cream. <laughs> That's left over from last week. We no longer have that problem because we did not cover a short when it was it dropped a tremendous amount of money. Again, the perils of the flickering ticks and a bar that from David Keller, and I'm not sure where he got it from, but you will get sucked into a moth like the screen and do a lot of things that you should not do when the market is volatile like it is. So you gotta be really careful. I can't short, what do I do? Well, fund your account. So next time you can short, keep in mind that shorting is not as easy as I sometimes make it look, okay? It looked pretty damn easy in this slide because we got short and the market slid. Problem is they all fire up at once. It's not like you could build that portfolio slowly over time like we do on the long side, okay? And buy a little, flip out some, trail a stop higher, get knocked out of the profit. You know, drop the F-bomb, then look and see your count is actually higher than it was a couple of months ago and feel pretty good about the process. Shorts are a whole nother ball of wax. The guru bragging has been unbelievable. And I'm sure now if this is the quote unquote the bottom, there's going to be a ton that come out the woodwork and say they predicted it. Just remember to predict early and often. And many have been predicting that. Quite a bit. This is left over from last week, but the model portfolio, my goal there is to show that it can be done in both good times and bad. Now, I don't know where it is today, but last week we actually turned positive. It went, we were positive obviously coming in. I took a snapshot at the peak and the portfolio was looking really good. The portfolio began to get creamed. I think that's the word of the day. But then shorts begin to trigger, and then the leftover shorts of the portfolio actually started working out really nicely. And that, for a while, was still negative overall, looking at where we were in February. But now it actually went back, at least it was last week, in the positive column. So that's pretty cool. Ebb and flow is key. That means letting the stops take you out of your positions. On the short side now, that means that you should have, on the last slide, taken partial profits it's like we got short i think three new ones they all banged out the initial profit target and then of course you started retracing back up as i think i said last week my aggressive trading paid off really well i was really aggressive on the long side ipos thinner stocks volatile stocks stuff that's even more crazy than i put in the model portfolio and i really did it i really did well until of course the market got whacked. I told my wife the number the other night after we had a few cocktails and uh, I thought she was going to throw up. And I said, well, baby, I'm, you know, we're making money back on the short side. And so she has faith in me. Thank God. Dr. Robert Mara wrote a book called Master in Fear. It's pretty good. I'd recommend you read it. One that I would recommend you read before you read that would be the Kaizen way, but I don't want to get on tangent on that. But in Mastering Fear and in a presentation he gave, I was speaking at a conference where he was the he was hired on as a psychologist to speak to the group. But at the conference, he talked about the importance of our social connection, which I guess is kind of, I'd be interested to see what he has to say about all this mess we're going through now with the social distancing and such. But he talked about, we have this need to be connected, okay? And we need other people as our support system. And trading can be a very lonely sport and I think it's very important that you interact with other traders. And that's why I started the Facebook group as part of the members area. It's completely free, except, I know there's a caveat, right? You know, other than the shooting, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? You have to be a gold member of DaveLander.com. And what's been fun there is you're able to see the signs and signals. And we've got head of market timing over there who is showing us his signals or when you see some of my signals triggering i think that's that's been a lot of fun and a lot of people have chimed in with some research and it's just been a wonderful thing for me it's the best thing that i have done in my career hands down and then you can follow along with the over trades which lately haven't done so well so i don't want to brag on that and then the four million dollar challenge which will make sense once you're there 
and that hasn't done so well either. <laughs> I'm not a very good salesman, am I? So here's a URL if you want to become a member, or you just go to davelander.com slash members. And by the way, there's a free market timing course there. I, I know everybody here is a member. That's fine. Uh, but for the people who aren't members watching the recording, there's also a free market timing course, which covers a lot of the stuff we've been talking about lately in detail. And I would recommend that you take that. Okay, let's hop out to the charts. And while I'm look, talking about the market and such, feel free to start asking about your individual stocks. And then you could also start asking about any other questions or ask any other questions you may have. So here's the weekly bow tie. This is a live view of the market, S&P 500. It's a little sloppy, meaning that it's not like a really, really, really tight one. Hey, Dave, show me a really tight one. Okay. Um, right there, right at the market top, we had a really tight, nice little crossing from all-time highs. Let's just zoom in and take a look at that. So you can see that they came together and kind of made more of a textbook bow tie at the top. I would not ignore this little bow tie at the bottom here either, you know, but let's just see how far it takes us. But you can see, oops, there's the bow tie back there. I'll take my word on it. All right, let's hop into the overall market or go in and look at the uh, slides. I'm sorry, and you can see it. How do you pick an expiration date when buying options for trend following? How far out do you recommend without having to pay too much premium? Well, Zach, that's kind of a $64,000 question. You should have a copy by now. Anybody who's a member of DaveLander.com, you will have, you will get, I think even free members, you will get a copy of Dave Landry on Swing Trading and Dave Landry's 10 Best Patterns and Strategy. And I think eventually you'll get layman's, for sure you'll get layman's eventually. But there's a chapter in Dave Landry on Swing Trading. I like the closer dated options in general. As I wrote in Dave Landry on Swing Trading, they have a worse decay profile, okay? Meaning that the time premium erodes really, really quickly. But that's what I prefer. Keep in mind right now, Zach, you know, like I said earlier, it's like sailing a hurricane, right? So you're thinking, let's buy options. Well, the option premiums are so extreme that it may not be worth your while. And as I said, I think last week, if this is your first rodeo, tread lightly. I was talking to one gentleman, and God bless him, he did really well. And he bought a bunch of options right before this whole thing blew up. But he probably didn't understand, because when I was talking about intrinsic versus extrinsic, he wasn't sure what I was talking about. And obviously, he didn't understand implied volatilities and all those things. The implied volatilities right now are through the roof. Okay. In fact, we even have somebody in the group that's talking about, I think it's Mike P is talking about just kind of their S and G's was looking at the volatility so high on these inverted chairs and, and these triple lever chairs that you could probably sell the call and buy the stock on both the inverted chairs and the normal up lever chairs. And you'd probably, do okay but that's a strategy with a lot of moving parts i woke up in the middle of the night a couple of nights ago thinking what if this the etf implodes yes you would make money on the on the short option the short call but then you need a damage control plan for the etf so it gets really messy really quick and yeah the premiums are just through the roof right now so you're gonna have to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the money the advantage of puts on the short side versus outright stock is that you don't have to put up as much money. And then the worst case scenario, God forbid, the most you can lose is what you put up. Whereas on the short side, in theory, you can lose more than you put up. Anyway, that's the S&P 500 on an hourly chart. So far, we do have a bow tie to the upside. I would not make a big picture decision on this longer term because the trend the big blue arrow continues to point lower and so far we're just in this retrace rally we could retrace up really really high i guess i'll know it when we see it but we could retrace quite a bit and the market would still be in trouble yeah we talked about an option book saliba's book which joe corona contributed to quite a bit joe corona is a friend of mine and he told me that he contributed a lot of uh, to a lot of saliba's book 
would be a good book to read. Larry McMillan, I'm good friends with Larry, wrote the original textbook Bible on options. It's if you watch some of these shows about financial stories or whatever, sometimes you could see his book in a bookshelf on the back, which is kind of cool. I've been looking for mine. I haven't seen them yet though. Yeah, it's good that it's good that you guys are helping each other. That's a half an hour chart by accident, fat finger. You can see nice tight bow tie. The entry would have been here yesterday. Let's see where we are on an hourly chart. Yeah, you know, it warms my heart to see you guys helping each other. And that's kind of the whole idea. You know, number one is only one of me. Number two, as I said earlier, I could get hit by a beer truck or my wife might kill me while we're in quarantine. <laughs> I've seen a lot of posts up. It's it's been a pandemic of uh, crazy posts and all. <laughs> One of them was, if you find me dead in the house within the next two weeks, I can assure you that the virus didn't kill me. Check my wife. Anyway, there's your bow tie. Look at that Nasdaq. That's a nice tight bow tie. Okay. So the trigger. Let me just let's just take a look at this. So there's your bow tie. The trigger would have actually been on the 25th would have actually been yesterday. So that's kind of interesting. Um, I wouldn't rush out and buy stocks based just on this, okay? But it does give you one little glimmer of hope that we may be in at best or at worst, I should say at worst, a retrace rally higher. Let's take a look at the Rusty while we're there. Rusty 2000 pulling back a little bit. This this thing has been a, a, a disappointment somewhat longer term. This is one I've been complaining about forever because it never did go on to make brand new highs since that December spill. And by the way, you know, this is one thing that I show people when I show them some of these sell signals that we get, that the Russell 2000 lost, I think 18% of its value after something like a bow tie to the downside. You can see it just got really ugly, really fast. And so that little spill we had in 2019, you know, if you survived it, you probably don't think it's that bad, but it was pretty ugly, I have to say. As you go through the sectors, everything has gotten creamed in here. I would be really careful trying to pick a low, pick a bottom or whatever. But you can see there's really no need to go through everything, but most areas like the market itself have sold off hard and so far are just retracing up a little bit. I wouldn't rush out and call the bottom just yet. We'll know it when we see it. It's gonna take much more than just an hourly buy signal in here. But do be prudent if you stay short, if you are short, I should say. And you should stay short, okay? I don't believe in just cashing out of everything. I just follow the system. And let yourself get stopped out in shorts. Obviously, take some partial profits along the way. And then, of course, trailer stops lower. Okay. The market is, so far, again, headed lower. Just we're in a bit of a retrace rally. Let's see where that takes us. Let's take a look at bonds real quick. And then if you guys want to talk about any individual stocks, feel free to start punching them in now. So these bonds absolutely imploded, okay? And can't really get a peak to trough on the fly. But yeah, just not even counting peak to trough. That's probably about a 30% move, peak to trough. That's a huge move in bonds. So bonds imploded. Like I said, the baby was getting thrown out with the bath water. We were in liquidation market. Let's take a look at gold. Gold went down on a closing basis about 12%. That's a big move for gold over a short period of time. I notice those idiots are going crazy on TV trying to sell you gold now. All right, any individual issues you guys want to look at? Anything you want to talk about? Is everybody staying safe? You're staying away from each other? <laughs> Louisiana is a hot spot. It's it's horrible. People are stupid over here. Some people are stupid. And church, about an hour away from here, maybe a little bit further, bust in people. And they had 1,800 people at the service, and they were all hugging and kissing and laying hands on each other and all. So now we have 1,800 idiots who are likely exposed. New Orleans is a hot spot, a really bad hot spot. And that's just lifestyle and probably bringing in a 10 million people from Mardi Gras didn't help just recently. And you know, a lot of people down here, not to call people idiots, but a lot of us live through Katrina and other hurricanes and we think we're tough. And this is this is not a hurricane, you know, this is something much different. And just because we live through a hurricane has nothing to do with this invisible thing going on. 
All right, no quite no stocks, no no questions, no amusing anecdotes. All right, well, I'm going to wrap things up. Then everybody stay safe. May the trend be with you. Anything unanswered, bring it up in the Facebook group if you're a member. And if you're not, DaveLander.com slash contact. Again, everybody stay safe. Thank you so much.